Welcome to today's Talk Business and Politics Daily. I'm Roby Brock. We are joined by John Brummett of the Arkansas Democrat Gazette because it's Monday and you show up here on Mondays. I'm uh, told Religiously. To, I'm told to. Well, yeah. well, we appreciate that. Yeah, I'm glad to. Also. Happy belated Thanksgiving. Did Same you have you. a good one? Good time off. I had a off. lovely one. A couple of days of uh, family and food activities. How about you? Uh, yeah, the same, and a lot of relaxation. So I actually didn't work for a couple of days, except that's unusual. That for you. coaching thing kind of came up, which we'll talk about. Oh yes, a little bit later. That oh yes, pulled me out of uh, my shell on a Friday. That happened. I forgot that. Yeah. All right. I need you to dispel a rumor that is going around right now. Um, the president tweets over this long <laughs> weekend that he is being considered as Times Person of the Year, but he decided declined to do it. Yeah. Are you in line to be Times Person of the Year, or are, did you decline as well? Uh, I'm in second place for Person of the Year at my own address, so <laughs> so I'm not likely to contend for that. But if they'd like to give it to me, I would be happy to give them an interview and sit for for portrait. You'd sit for the photo. I would shoot. be. I'd be more than happy to. This. Uh, would you want to be at your typewriter? I would, I guess, or. Uh, or maybe cutting the grass. Those are the two things I can do, <laughs> cut the grass and type. Uh, so one of those. Th this, this whole th I mean, how many times can we say that Trump is just a, a, an incredible child caricature? You've got this grown man, supposedly, 70 some odd years old, with this vain hairdo, and, and, and he, just, he just is so transparent in his in his pursuit of superficial manifestations of seeming glory. That is, being president of the United States with the responsibilities and the authority and the acclaim thereof ought to be enough for any man. But he's worried about whether he's going to be the time person of the year. And if he declines to do an interview and they give it to someone else, he wants to preempt that by saying, I could have had it. What? <laughs> What's the matter with this guy? I mean, it's just. He is looking to give political columnist something to write about yeah, but on it's a routine become, basis. It's become banal. You notice I haven't said preposterous second place president in two or three weeks until just now, which <laughs> reminds me to put it in my next column. Uh, the other thing is, I, I, time denies it, but if in any way a periodical, news periodical, intimates that you'll be the person of the year, but we need something for it, then it's journalistic malpractice. Uh, I hope that in no way was even suggested, you know? Yeah. Well, maybe we'll see if there's more to that story that comes out. Uh, they, they, the time says it's absolutely false, and we'll find out December 6th who is the, They may give it to him anyway, just to show yeah. how magnanimous they are. The President of the United States ought to be the person of the year every year in terms of his impact on our culture and our politics and international and national uh, issues. Uh, and that a man, and, and that one of them would worry about whether he gets it, is uh, almost unbelievable. It would be unbelievable in the pre-Trump era. So you're saying it's kind of like LeBron James should get NBA MVP every year, but because they can't give it to him every year, but they, they got to give it to someone else. But they can't. But it's I, I don't think LeBron, from what I sense from him. He doesn't need to be called the MVP every year to know that he's the MVP every year. <laughs> I think he thinks when he wants to take it to the hoop, he can do that. Yeah. Trump, not that way. I got you. Not that way. <laughs> Let's stay with some national politics. We'll take a commercial break in a little bit and come back and talk some state stuff. Okay. Let's stay with national politics right now. Big potential this week in terms of a vote on a major tax bill in the U.S. Senate. What is your sense right now if you had to put some small money on it? Because I don't think any of us would bet big money on anything that Washington may or may not do. Does the Senate get a tax bill out and it go to reconciliation? Or do, we, uh, do, we, do you think they fail? One good thing about doing this every Monday, and I appreciate the opportunity, is that within, over those seven days, things can change. And I can, I can correct anything I may have said the, uh, the week before. I believe I sat in this chair last week and said, I bet before it's over, they'll end up passing only the corporate tax cut. They'll take it from 35 to 20 or 22 and declare victory. And that, that would be a tax cut, and it would be Republicanish, and they could uh, boast about it. This week, I'm persuaded by the words of Lindsey Graham, that great Republican philosopher from South Carolina, right. who said, uh, failing on reducing taxes, failing on cutting taxes is not a Republican option. That is, you know, 
we're going we're going to before Christmas before the new year we're going to cut somebody's taxes and I'm now thinking it's going to be some heavily amended uh, nuanced version of what the Senate now has uh, whether the individual mandate uh, repeal stays in it whether whether the uh, treatment of small business changes whether th things are put in it to to bring along a few more votes I, I don't I think there will be a, a generally comprehensive Republican tax bill uh, that will pass before New Year's Day. They may have to work the week between Christmas and New Year's to get it done. But I think Lindsey Graham says it right. Republicans, come on, that's why, they, that's why they're there. They cut taxes and uh, they've, they've, uh, they've got to do it. Right now there are, between the deficit hawks like Corker and Flake, between uh, Collins and the senator from Kansas who don't like the mandate, right. uh, between uh, two very conservative, uh, uh, Johnson and one other guy from Montana, who, who don't like the idea that the corporate tax rate would be reduced, but small business people would still pay at individual rates passed through. They've got, a, uh, they've, they've got at least six I've mentioned right there, and they can only spare two. Yeah, Murkowski seems like she's Murkowski on board Murkowski got bought out with a uh, uh, drilling in the mm -hmm. Arctic uh, wildlife refuge. Right. That's, that's also on the tax bill. So we can see those Which we have of an overabundance of oil in our supply right now, so some would argue... She may, like, that may be that. unfair to her. She may truly believe the individual mandate is bad, but just for insurance. Well, she had said earlier she wanted, um, she wanted an Alexander Murray bill passed right. before she would go with the individual mandate portion of it. But things change. Things do change. So, uh, which, by the way, is, a, is an important thing, this Alexander Murray bill, because if we do away with the individual mandate and the cost sharing subsidies, uh, we got absolute chaos in Bedlam where an increment of chaos in Bedlam now exists in the health insurance market. So, this is all very big. And we'll just, but, but I, I now think. Come on, Republicans are going to find a way to get to 50, 50, 50 votes because they got pens. They got pens. Yep. So let's do a little political prognostication. How does that play out in next year's elections? Is this is an unpopular tax bill right now? If you look at the polling on this, do Republicans get credit that they did something and finally achieve something with their majority, or do voters look at how this impacts them? And you see some potential, you know, worries for some of the folks that may have to pay more in taxes, and it becomes an albatross around their neck that they actually passed tax cuts, or it throws the healthcare markets into chaos, like you suggested, and then that becomes a, an anvil for them. Probably it's it, it may depend on who's got the best uh, uh, spend doctors, uh, because we won't have any empirical fact by the next mid, by the midterms to to answer that question. I tend to think. But this, this may just be my wishful thinking because I so abhor this policy that they're going to be so much, uh, that, the, that the independent, centrist voters of the country are going to be so dubious that this is really a significant tax cut and that uh, the health care market has been, un, has been uh, made uh, more volatile and that the deficit may rise and that they may not get much tax cut out of it, but people in the upper income tax brackets will, even though they're holding the 39%, those people are gonna get a tax cut along the way to 39%. I think it could be, it could be a net negative for the Republicans. Mm -hmm. We'll see how that plays we'll out. We'll see. Let's take a, a commercial break, come back and talk well, a little if you need to. Razorback football. Oh, good. Can we? Oh, uh, yes. Yes, yes I'm, an, I'm an authority there. We're back with John Brummett right after this word from our sponsors. Arkansas Electric Cooperative Corporation provides electric energy across two-thirds of Arkansas. This is an exciting time in our energy history, with incredible progress being made in renewable energy and storage technologies. As our energy portfolio continues to diversify, we'll maintain an all-the-above strategy to provide reliable and affordable electricity. Ever since the first light bulbs were placed in our members' homes, the electric cooperatives have been the solutions provider for our members, and we want to continue that well into the future. Each day, the promise of our nation begins again. Arkansas and America moving forward. I help make that promise a reality. It's not for everyone, but people everywhere depend on us. Oh, I love you too, Trucking delivers or everything stops. And that's what drives me. And welcome back to this edition of Talk Business and Politics Daily. I'm with John Brummett of the Arkansas Democrat Gazette. 
Let's turn our attention to Hogville. Hogville, the website Busy. or or, our, or the Razorback Nation? The Razorback Nation, which yes. is also, I think, a website too. So I guess is, is there now a Razorback I, Nation there's, website? There's if a not, lot of we stuff. should start one. Well, Go ahead. There's no one really to keep you from you know Doing not that. using the image and all that stuff these days too with Jeff Long gone. Although the new athletic director, the interim athletic director, she may, may she, she may get tough. She, she may. She, all right, <laughs> let's begin with this whole firing of the head coach. We yeah. saw Jeff Long terminated. Now we see uh, Brett Bielema terminated. And I don't think anybody was not expecting right. uh, that to happen. So um, what was your reaction to the way it all played out and some of the Twitter reaction to it? There's been a kind of a 50-50 divide on how well it was handled. Yeah, I think... I think the convention, the, the, there was this supposed truth that he, which was so powerful an image that everybody went with it, that, that they fired him on the sideline after the game. And, and, well, that's just not right to do a man that way. That, that's just, and, and around the country, people were saying, Bielema fired on the sidelines uh, after the game. He wasn't. He was told that the athletic director needed to see him in an office inside uh, and where she told him, that he was, at that point, fired. So I, I, I get so frustrated with, with, with misstatements of what actually happened that, that permeate the popular culture, largely because of social media. Because it goes quick. Man. It's when out it there happens, and you can't get it back once uh, a few million have, uh, of, <laughs> right. uh, have seen it. Uh, all, the criticism that he shouldn't have been fired that, that night, I, I dismiss. I mean, he's gone. He was planning a recruiting trip, trip the next day. Let's not, let's not take that, Brett. We, you don't need to be trying right. to recruit. Uh, and also, uh, you're not going to a bowl game. Some of these kids may disperse. They love you. You love them. Go. This is your best chance to have a, to, to, to meet with all of them or, or say goodbye. So let's just go ahead and tell the truth right now as to what's happening. I find that perfectly decisive and appropriate. Yeah. I have no problem with it. And many people do. Others are still thinking she fired him on the field or they think it was all uh, too brutal. I, I, I don't. What's the difference in that night uh, and, and, and Monday other than he's wasted a weekend on a recruiting trip because he's not really the coach? So I didn't have any, I didn't have any problem with that. The, I don't know if you're getting to it. Uh, right. I don't want to... Sometimes you I go feel off. Free. Go ahead. My column tomorrow is is that this firing drama was was more or couldn't have been. I think my lead is couldn't have been more lathered in gender politics if Al Franken had been cupping rear ends. That's the way I put it. <laughs> was that? Can you do that? We'll see. <laughs> I just did it on on here. I just did it on here. It will survive this okay. uh, place. <laughs> we'll I don't see. know about your editors. We'll see if the editor Gazette. wants to change uh, some of my <laughs> phrasing. But, but this was a remarkable advancement in our culture that, that should be noted. Uh, a big, tough, oversized man football coach gets fired by a woman athletic director who then, and she's only an interim woman athletic director, who then tells the press, I, I'll hire your new coach, thank you very much. And you got all, you got David Basil on Channel 7, on, I can't believe she said that, I wonder if Frank Broyles is turning over in his monument, you know, and, and, and it's, it's set off this whole, this whole reaction, which is part gender, also part just the Razorback culture. Mm -hmm. And I try to explain all that tomorrow. <laughs> Well, and, don't spoil your column. I well, want I, just, to I try it, to so. explain it. Well, I think we'll read it. Don't worry. Okay. A couple of them. <laughs> but I try to explain it in a way that tries to understand both points of view. So I'm probably just going to get slaughtered from both sides. But that's part of being a, an attempted truth teller in the modern age. The good news is, is that whatever uh, negative national focus might have come on Arkansas from all this, Tennessee took it away from us almost immediately. Is this, is this utter the madness? The whole SEC carousel. Is this utter madness? We're going to spend $60 million on buyouts of coaches in the SEC. I saw somebody. I thought somebody said that the Tennessee, in case people don't know, Tennessee entered into a memorandum of understanding to hire the, what, the defensive coordinator for Ohio State, mm -hmm. and the fans became outraged, and some st Tennessee state legislators became outraged upon the leak of this news because this guy was once alleged to have seen something in the Sandusky affair in Penn State, which he categorically denied. 
And there's even some talk that by signing a memorandum of understanding and then pulling out of it hours later, they owe him some money. Yeah. In addition to what they owe on buyouts. And, and you've got, it, it's, uh, it's just, the SEC is, is there are other, other Nebraska's involved, UCLA is involved, but in the SEC, a and is firing its coach. We fired ours. Mississippi State loses its. It's because Florida fired its. Um, Ole Miss is going to keep their interim coach after the last one got, got, uh, lost, uh, caught up in scandal. Tennessee going through its deal. Florida's it, got their coach. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Florida, any, any SEC team except maybe Vanderbilt that doesn't at least get seven or eight wins is apparently going to buy somebody's contract. That's just that's just part of the. You picked uh, the wrong profession, basically, is what you're trying to do. And I here. would have been an excellent football coach. <laughs> would you now? Uh, no, <laughs> I was a, quite a horrible football player. I didn't like. What you played football? When junior What did high. you play? Well, I was small then, and I played uh, some defensive back. I was even the second string quarterback for a junior. Well, you know, junior in high. junior high, they don't really throw the football. So by putting you at defensive back, just means you padded the pile. When no, the no, tackles no, were done. it means I got run over by a larger <laughs> fullbacks called Moose. <laughs> there was one guy, his name was Morris, but he went by Moose, and I found out one day when he went right over me. We learn all kinds of new things. I prefer, every time. I was not bad, I was small then, people won't believe it, and quick. I was pretty good at, at returning punts because the object of returning punts is to run from people trying to hurt you. <laughs> But this idea that I'd go stick my head in and try to hurt somebody, I've never understood why young men do that. You never got called for targeting, is what you're saying. No. I, I, head, <laughs> body, feet, ankles, I won't target anything. Just go on. All right. John Brummett, the Ken Hatfield of political there you go. writing in Arkansas. Everybody's thinking, that guy was a defensive back. I was small in junior high school. My, my, my weight came on me later. And then tennis. But then we can't start this over. We're, we're wrapping um, this one you up. John stop, Ruppet, stop. thank you thank you, for my being man. here. And thank you for watching. That's all for today's program. I'm Roby Brock. We'll see you next time.